Hey, I'm Tim Faircloth from Alcoholic. Hey, and uh, I'm a member of the Warsaw Kenansville group of alcoholics, Nomas and Dupin County. And if you're over that way, you're going to the beach on Tuesday night or Thursday night, uh, look us up. We'll be glad to have you. You'll find the same thing there that, that I found tonight, and myself and my family, is a warm group of sober people that welcome us into this building and this church and for this meeting. Now, the primary purpose group of Southern Pines is known in a lot of places. We talk about you down there in our part of the country, and we're a long way, we're two hours from here. But we appreciate the work that you've done, especially with the institutional work in our district and uh, working with the uh, prison system has been a part, big part of it for you. Uh, I said my, my sobriety date's November 13th, 1975, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, honored to say that. Uh, I'm a very grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My, I, I'm just grateful that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful that I got my family here tonight for some support. If I get emotional up here, it'd be their fault, not my fault. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they, they are not members of AA, but they've certainly uh, been very supportive of me in, in my quest for sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous and their participation in, in our, our sister group, al and uh, I'm grateful for that. I looked down on the board and I saw some newcomers in here. Uh, are you here? Newcomers? Got two newcomers in the room? I don't want to embarrass you, but if you're here, you know, hold up your hand. What? A, yeah, there we go. What's your name? Haley. Haley. Haley, I said my, my sobriety date's November 13th, 1975. And I want you to know we walk shoulder to shoulder. Each other, we're equal to each other. We'll always be that way in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want you to know that. I want you to come back and, and, and stay with us and be part of this, this quest for sobriety. Uh, I've been told that, that uh, and sometimes I say it behind the podium, that I'm not a speaker, I'm a storyteller. And I just like to start the night by telling you a story. And it has nothing to do with my story. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, as you hear it, it has everything to do with it. Uh, a couple of years ago, before COVID, my neighbor is an elementary school teacher in the elementary school down in the little town we grew up in. And she went on uh, social media, Facebook, and she published an article or a post. She had put a post on that. And, and the post was about what they did at Easter time in the elementary school there in Kingsville. What they would do, all those elementary teachers would get together and they'd buy these plastic, large plastic Easter eggs that you can break apart. And they would take them home and they'd put a treat or a prize of some type in there, bring it back, and the next day they would hide them and at recess all the children in the elementary school would go out and find Easter eggs. And they had a good time. This year, she said in her post, that they did it differently. Rather than giving, for, rather than the teachers taking the Easter egg home and putting something in there, they gave each one of the children a plastic Easter egg with these instructions. Go home, find something that has no monetary value, but something that's very, very special in your life. And put it in that egg and bring it back. And the children did that. So the teachers go out there and hide this, and I'm reading this on Facebook. The kids go out and they find the Easter egg, they come back in the room, and then they open them. And she had two eggs that she posted pictures of. Them. And the first one that was open had pebbles in it, little rocks. And a little boy in the back of the room, I understand, is probably was a little boy named Johnny. <laughs> Johnny held up his hand and he said, that's my Easter egg. Rocks are special. Me, I love to uh, collect rocks, so they're very special to me. The next egg that was open 
and it was out there. Had a white AA uh, surrender chip, desire chip in it. Now, what I've told you up to this point is in fact. What I'm going to tell you from now on is conjecture on my part. And I looked at that, and the teacher had no idea what that white poker chip meant, you know. But I'm thinking about that kid. And I'm thinking about that special thing in his life, that white chip. And something happened in his, in his house or in his home that made it very special for him. Mom and Daddy weren't fussing anymore. There was no fighting in the house. Daddy was, or Mama was bringing the paycheck home. There was food on the table. And rather than strife and anger, there was joy and peace. And, and so it made that thing, even though he may have not have known the significance of it, but it made that white desire shit very special in his life. Now, I don't know where you don't know me, but here's what I thought. I can't wait. I'll go and tell that teacher exactly what that thing was because the whole post stopped right there, you know, with that white chip open up. And then I thought, I can't do that. As much as I'd like to go and sit down and tell her the meaning of that chip, I don't have the right to break that family, that son, that boy, and that family's anonymity. So maybe one day, years from now, I'll get a chance to really tell her what that thing meant for me. And I love that story. It's just a big part of my life. And it seems like it's part of my life. Uh, as I've traveled the years, and it's been 45 of them in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've come to believe, and I've seen this, that, that, that we kind of run on two what I call radical um, principles. And one of them is radical honesty. And that just, I'm Jim and I'm alcoholic. And the other one is radical dependence. I can't, but we can. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why we're here today. We support each other in this program. Without that dependence on God and the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, there would have been no way for me to stay sober. And my story uh, begins on a, a tobacco farm in southeastern North Carolina. Large family, seven children, grandma and grandpa lived in the house, so it was 11 people in an old big farmhouse. And I grew up in a hard-working, church-going, non-drinking family. So when I got ready to drink, I didn't have a whole lot of training. I had to kind of do it off on my own, you know. And I, I tell this story, and this is not a true story, but it could be a true story. <laughs> and if my mother was around, that's what so, she would say, no, it's not a true story, but it could be a true story. I think sometime when I was in that crib, you know, as a little baby or a small child, and somebody came by and they threw a bottle of milk in the crib for me. Now, they didn't throw a bottle of milk in there. They gently and lovingly handed me a bottle of milk. And, and, and now, remember, this is not a true story, but it could be a true story. And I drank that bottle of milk, and I threw the bottle out. And I looked at them, I said, well, I've tried that. What else have you got? <laughs> you know? And I found what else have you got when I was 15 years old. And uh, it changed my life. I was 15 years old, I called a ride uh, at a local hangout, it was a little driving grill, 1950s, and you have to understand everybody, all the teenagers, I mean, would meet down at that little driving grill, it's called Hunter. And uh, we would sit around and talk about what we were going to do. And the boys would tell the other boys what they were going to do, and they'd go off and do what they said they were going to do, and when they came back, they lied about it. You know, that was the kind of place that we were at. But you could catch a ride over to the next town, a teenage club, or a basketball game, or something like that. So me and my best buddy, Jeffrey, was sitting in Honeyland. We were waiting for a ride. This guy drove up, and he was in a pretty cool car. He was pretty cool. He had the right kind of haircut. He wore the right kind of clothes. Uh, he walked the right way, and he kind of sashayed 
hung around and looked around and looked at two old boys over our country boys, me and Jeffrey, 15 years old, said, you all want to go to a ball game tonight? And I tell you, we sure do. We jumped in that pitch board and we went over to neighboring town to a basketball game. And it was good, you know, and I was, this guy we were riding with was the Fonz before there was a Fonz, you know. <laughs> and uh, the girls were kind of noticing him, and surely if they noticed him, they might see me. And, and that felt good. And, and the ball game was good, and we enjoyed each other's company. And we went out and got in that uh, 54 to go and come back home. Well, anyway. And uh, before they cranked up, one of the boys pulled out a bottle of booze. And I'm not even sure what it was. I know it was homemade. I don't know where it quite looked, or I think it was. Or it could have been home brew or homemade wine. Whatever it was, it would get you drunk. <laughs> I know that. And, and, and those older boys took a drink out of it. Yeah. And I looked in the back seat at two 15-year-olds. And I said, you boys want a drink? My best buddy, Jeffrey, I mean, he was my best buddy from the first grade. I said, yeah, I want a drink. And I was kind of amazed. Uh, but they handed him that jug, and I was more amazed when he turned that thing up and took two or three big gulps out of it, pulled it back down, and before he ever said it, and before he ever chased it, or a little lucky striped cigarette, he just wiped the back, took it back of his hand, wiped his mouth, and he said, it's the best I ever drunk. <laughs> and I knew he was lying. He hadn't ever taken a drink before in his life. And they're looking over at me. Now, what's a 15-year-old going to do? Now, I thought about the uh, time for my grandmother would describe what happens to people who drink that stuff out of that jar. I knew what it was. But I, 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 I thought about the dangers in doing that. I thought about violating the trust that my parents had put in me because I told them I'd probably be a good boy wouldn't do anything they didn't want me to do, you know. And, and I was going to violate that trust if I took that bottle, a <laughs> drink out of that bottle. And, uh, but I had another thought, and that overrode all the rest. What's going to happen if I don't take it? We're going back to Hunter Lane. And those older boys are going to tell them, everybody, Jeff, we man enough to take a drink and give me one. It'd be all over school the next day, and it'd be so embarrassing. I said, give me that jug. I kind of wanted to anyway. <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't know what was in it, but I, I felt like I knew, you know, there was adventure in it. There was good times and, and, and doing things and going places in that jug because I heard people talk about it. And so... Good. I took that jug and I turned it up and I took a big drink out of it. And I don't know how much more I drank that night, but it was more than that one drink. As we were pulling into Honeyland, those two older boys were trying to get the jug away from me and Jeffrey and we wouldn't give it to them. <laughs> we had that thing cornered. Now I got silly, I got drunk, I got sick, I threw up, I passed out, and I got in trouble, and that's my drinking story. I don't have to go any further. It bothered me for the next 20 years. So maybe not as severe and as bad as it was that night. High school drinking was like it. High school drinking it was, you know. It was careless. Uh, can't think of any more words, but it was, uh, it was not a responsible way to drink. A few of us would get together and whatever we could find. Uh, if we could get enough money together and find somebody to go to the liquor store, or if we could buy some beer somewhere, or, or whatever it was, we'd get together and we'd drink that stuff. The same thing, you know, it's crazy. I look back on it, and there was beautiful girls around in our community. And about five or six of us boys would get together and get us a jug of booze and go to a drive-in theater and sit there and look at each other and drink that stuff, you know, and get drunk. And uh, I never, never have understood why we would do that. But anyway, uh, getting in trouble a little bit and nothing severe that I couldn't get out of. Had the opportunity, and it was really an opportunity. My, my parents were able at the time uh, to send me uh, to uh, off to school after graduating from high school. Now in high school I'd been an athlete or I started out being one and I thought I was pretty good, I probably wasn't. 
played a little baseball and basketball, but when, when I found that drink at 15 years old, that spiral started and went down and down and down. I lost interest in sports. I lost interest in schoolwork. Uh, everything in my life started crashing, started going down. But I went off to college, and uh, I had a failed attempt at college. The only good thing uh, that uh, I was able to do or come out of college with was a wife, my wife, Annis. And last month, on May the 20th, we celebrated 60 years of continuous marriage. And I'm grateful for that. She's always been the wing, wing I'm putting my wings. I'm grateful that she would stay with me. I'm grateful that, that she wanted to keep a family, so desperately wanted to keep a family together that she put up with a lot of stuff that she didn't have to put up with. And I'm grateful for her. Thank you. Anyway, we got married and started adult life and children started coming along. We had three, a son and two daughters. Brooke sitting here is my youngest daughter. And uh, got a story about her I'll tell in a few minutes. And uh, we started our adult life. We left that little town that we grew up in and uh, business opportunity came available in, in Wake County and Raleigh. And I went up and uh, I worked hard and uh, worked long hours. I thought I worked harder than anybody else, but I didn't. I used that for excuse to drink like I was drinking. I'd work hard during the day and I'd sit down in the basement of that store and I'd drink whiskey at night uh, for a long time. And a lot of times, right, most of the time, right down there by myself. And that's the way I wanted to drink. I felt the gloom and the doom of life. I thought everybody had it better than me. I thought everybody was picking on me. People were starting to talk about my drinking. They started, uh, the drinkers started talking about payments that I was supposed to be making. They were just everything that could happen was happening to me. So the thing to do, the natural thing to do is just go down there in the basement. That, that store, the grocery store had a, uh, a full basement in it, and that was our stock room, and cut the lights down real low, sitting in there by yourself, getting that jug in there, and sit there and think about those people that were causing pain in my life. I started inventorying before Alcoholics Anonymous. I started writing their names down, how I was going to get back at them, what I was going to do. My wife's name was on there because she won't treat me like I thought she ought to be treating me, you know. And, it just a lot of things. And I was sitting down there one Saturday at night, and I hadn't planned on telling this story, but I, Steve said something about it. I tell it, and it has something a little bit to do with Wallace sitting over there. But I was sitting down there drinking by myself, and it was on Saturday night. And about 12 o'clock, I'm sitting down there, and I get tired of my company. I want somebody to drink with me. So in downtown Raleigh on Saturday night, you opened up the back door of a grocery store, and the first guy I walked by I said, Buddy, you want a drink? He said, You got one? I said, Hell yeah, come on in. I got a whole store full of it, you know. And, and uh, he said, Good. So he came on in. I've never seen this guy before in my life. And uh, he sat down, and we started sharing with each other. We started fellowshipping. And we started drinking together. You know, we drank together for a period of time. Both of us got drunk. And I got thinking, or he got thinking, said, isn't there something else we could do just rather than sitting down here and drinking and looking at each other? I said, buddy, you ever shot a 38? <laughs> he said, what's a 38? It's, it's a pistol. You put bullets in it and you pull the trigger. He said, you got one? I said, yeah, upstairs. And also got a whole box of bullets. He said, go get it. <laughs> I went upstairs and I got a 38 revolver and a box of bullets and I came down and, and we went in the back of that uh, basement and that store, the stock room, and we took bales of uh, grocery bags, paper bags back then, took a uh, magic marker and put a bullseye on it. We had to do it right. Walked back to the other end and we started shooting that bullseye. We missed a lot. No brick columns down there, and brake dust was flying, bullets were zinging around. I'm just a two and a half blocks from Central Police Station, downtown Raleigh. Wonder if they hadn't locked me up, you know. And we're shooting and ketchup splattered up on the wall and vinegar running out on the floor. And 
At some time during that process, I went to sleep. Now, I passed out what I did, you know. And I came to, and you know when you come to from a pass out, I don't care how long it is or how short it is, but you come to, you start remembering things a little bit. And I got to remembering him. I started looking around, I couldn't find him. And I said, come, you think I've killed him? I don't know, I remember, I saw that pistol and all the bullets, you know, so I start looking for him, I can't find him. Uh, I, I, I know today what happened, he just got scared and tired and went out the back door and left. If he ever took anything, I never found anything that was missing. I didn't see that guy for a long, long time. And I got sober and broken by the Hawks, and I was when I had about five years. I was invited to go over to Central Prison and care a meeting over there on, I believe it was on Tuesday night. Am I right on that? Well, it's Tuesday night, sounds like it, right. And we, I went over there for a, a lot of years taking a message there. And uh, we were sitting in there, and at that time, they wouldn't let but 21 men being in the triangle group at Central Prison. And one would get shipped off. Most of those guys in there for, for life, most of them. And, and they brought in, somebody got shipped out, I reckon, and they brought a new man in. And had the meeting started, and I was leading it. And the guards brought him to the room and unshackled him, told him to go in and take a seat. And during that whole hour, I'm sitting there looking at him, and I'm wondering where I know him from. I know him from somewhere. So after the meeting, I walked up and I stuck my hand out and shake hands with him. I said, man, I think I know you. He said, hell, I know you. You're that crazy groceryman. There was a 38, you know. <laughs> God protects drunks and fools, all right, you know. Kept, kept up with him for a while, but uh, uh, I don't know. I moved, and I think they shipped him out, and I lost contact with him. But I, going into that meeting at Central Prison, Gordon Garrison called me in his office one day, and he said, Yeah, those guys that you were meeting with, when they came in here, they were incorrigible. We had to segregate them from the rest of the prison population because of their behavior. He said, but they start going to meetings of alcoholics and anonymous, and they at the day they're a model prisoner. And I think, and I think I can say this from my observation and meeting with them for about five years, that some of the best character I've ever met men, those twenty one men, twenty one men sent to prison in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we drink and we start going places. We start losing things, and I believe at some point in my life, maybe in early in Annis and I's marriage, that, that I could have quit drinking if, if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. And then when I got to the point in my life that maybe I would want to quit, it was too late. I couldn't do it. And that's the way this disease works or the way it worked in me. But uh, yeah, I started, things started happening in my life and losing things and uh, going places. And I guess when Annis got to the point that she needed some rest, <laughs> and she needed me away, my mom and daddy would come down and get me. And they'd take me back to the old farmhouse and uh, I'll tell you what to do. They carry that farmhouse and lock you up in the back, back bedroom and they feed you chicken soup in the Bible for about a week. You get sober. <laughs> I promise you that, you know. And I'd come back out and I'd have a meal or two with mom and daddy and they would hardly look up from the table. And by that time, they were the only two in that house. They'd drive me back out to, to Raleigh and wouldn't say a word until we got there. My daddy would get out. He did this every time, and they carried me a lot of time to sober up, either down there, a little fishing camp at uh, the beach or, or through there at that old farm house. And daddy would always say something like this to me. Jimmy, go in there and look after that wife and those three children you got. Go down there and look after that business you got. Go down to the Baptist church on Sunday and you talk to that preacher and tell him you need their prayers and their help. 
and stay away from those people that are causing you to drink like you do. And that's, that's, they didn't understand the disease of alcoholism. It was not those other people, it was me. They didn't understand that I couldn't quit from my family, I couldn't quit from them. But I was dying of alcoholism on the inside. Have a gut clock in here, I don't know. Kind of hard to know. I got a watch, I can look at that. <laughs> good, I'm good. Uh, many things happen in, in, in my life as an alcoholic. And a lot of tragedy happened there. A lot of things that I would like to change or, uh, if I could. Uh, but most of those things drove me to my knees, so I'm grateful for that. A few, a short period of time before I called out the four Alcoholics Anonymous found me, my daughter was sitting here was about seven years old. And she was visiting in the neighborhood with one of her little school chums. And they did what little girls do on the afternoon. They enjoyed each other's company. They played with their dolls and they colored in coloring books, I guess. Maybe watched a little television or played some jack rocks. But they just had a good time and was enjoying it each other's company. And when it got time for her to go home, she looked at her little friend and said, I want you to come over to my house and, and visit with me. And the daddy heard it. And he said, honey, my daughter can't go over to your house. Your daddy was an alcoholic. It even stings at this stuff. I don't know what it did to her. She's a grown woman now with two grown children or three grown children in her life. And she remembers it. So obviously it had something to do with her life. Now it's taught sometimes in a room of alcoholics and honest, and I don't like it and I don't involve myself in it. With where we are on the ladder or wherever we were. What if some people are trying to say, well, I was alcoholic, but I want as bad as you. And that, they're probably right. They won't be as bad as me. But I don't believe that. I believe we're all equal in this program. We're equal in our disease, and we're equal in our sobriety. And uh, if I had to tell you, and I will tell you, that I was the worst kind of alcoholic that could be. I was the very worst. I didn't have the decency to get out there on the street. I took my alcoholism into a home and my family, I faith with a wife and three children. That's the worst kind for me. So on November 13, 1975, and uh, it could have been November, well, but it's sometime around midnight, uh, I came out of a three-day blackout. Uh, I guess, I don't know. I, just, I don't have any recall of the last three days. They said I went into work and did some things. I, I know I was in a bad way. When I came out of that blackout, I was as scared as I've ever been in my life. I knew I was going to walk into a house that was empty. There was not going to be a wife in there and three children. I don't know where I could have done that or not. And the reason I know that, my daddy had come down a few days before and he said he was going to take him out of the life, probably the best gift he ever gave me when he kicked me out of the life. I'm not let your children and your wife live like this anymore. We've done everything we can for you. And don't you come home unless you change the direction of your life. And he left with that. So my direction in my life hadn't changed. I couldn't change it, I tried to change it. So I was sitting there that morning or night and thinking that I had an empty house to go in. I'm also thinking about the business I'd worked in and Rover for all those years, that it was on its last legs. It was just, it was just, it was ready to collapse. My health was getting bad. 
I'd lost the respect of people in the neighborhood, the family, families around. Your daughter can't come over. My daughter can't go over to your house. Your daddy's an alcoholic. All these things were there. It was not a very pretty time in my life. I knew drinking was part of it. And I tried for a period of time to do something about it, but nothing had worked for me. So if it don't work for you, what, let, what it left me with, with hopelessness, I don't know what to do. The thought of death, the wrong kind of death, was crossing my mind, and how to do it, and why, how to do it, and if I could do it. And that was terrifying, too. And all these things were boiling up in, in my mind. I'm sitting there probably crying. And the only thing I needed to do, and I've heard of many of people, or a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous say this. I just bowed my head and hung it over that steering wheel, I guess, the best I could. And I prayed the drunk's prayer, just God help me. No reservations, no strings attached. I don't care what happens. I can't live like this any longer. Please help me. Now, if I think about it real hard, I think that might be the first step of the program by Hawks and Hawks. Well, I meant that I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable and I was doing that then. And I need help. I can't do it by myself. And I believe this. If you're new here, back in the back, hey, Lee, I believe, if you're new here, Take that first step, you better hold on, and really mean it, you better hold on to your hat because things are going to happen, and they're going to happen fast in your life. They started happening real quick for me. My wife and children came out of the car and got this old drunk out. He couldn't walk, or he couldn't walk on his own. And they were getting me in the house, and I said, Honey, I'll do anything. She said, Good, I've got a telephone number. And she had a phone number in her pocket, and there's a long story about that that I can't develop, but she got that phone number out. A, a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous had given that number to her. His name was Hawk. And uh, he said, if Jimmy ever wants to do anything about his drinking, please call me. And she remembered that number. And she made that call, and it was after 12 o'clock at night, and that man had to go to work the next day. He was still working. But he got out of a bed, left the family, and drove across town in a November rainstorm. It was cold and dreary night to talk to a drunk like me. And he told me later as he pulled up in the driveway of my house and was walking up there trying to get in out of the rain, there was a little blonde-headed girl standing in a carport. And she said, are you here to help my daddy? He's a sick man. And he said he'd do all he could. And he walked in and he came in with a big book on his arm and some literature in his hand. And this is something that I'm so grateful that he did. He's taught to my wife and my children first. And he told them there was a program for them. And that he'd have his wife call the next day and, and, uh, and he did and she did. And it was a pro program for them. And then he turned his attention towards me, and I'm kind of like Dr. Bob when Bill came. My thought was, you know, I'm sobering up a little bit, getting a little bit of stuff back together. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bob told his wife, I'll give him about 15 minutes, then I'm gone. And I think that's probably what I said. I'll give him about 15 minutes, and out the back door I'll go. And he'd sit there and talk all night long if he wants to, you know. I'm tired of being lectured at, fussed at, and all those things that go along with me as a drunk. He didn't. But he sat down and he did something that nobody else has ever done. He started telling me a story about a boy that grew up in southeast of North Carolina and 15 years old after a football game with some older boys, a bottle was passed and he took a drink. He told me where that drink carried him, man, over in the European theater, the Second World War flying bombers over there with a fifth electric sitting under his seat so he had the courage to fly. He told me about coming back and going to Washington, D.C. and had a very responsible job at the State Department and how drinking had taken that job away from him. He had almost lost his life and his family and everything else because of his, of his drinking. 
And he told me he found a solution for it. The solution was in the program by Alcoholics Anonymous. And that he'd be back the next night and take me to a meeting of AA if I wanted to go. Now, when he left, I don't know where I wanted to quit drinking. I don't know where I wanted to get sober. I don't know where I wanted to go to AA. But I knew one thing. I wanted to be like him. Attraction. I was attracted right because of that man, right into the mainstream of Alcoholics Anonymous. He came back as promised, and I went to my first big, my first meeting, Big Book Group in Raleigh, North Carolina. No, I didn't need a diversity group. And the lady gave me my desired chip, that white poker chip that I talked about earlier. Got married, I got sober in the forties. She was one of the. Uh, early members of Pop Alcoholics Anonymous in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's dead now. And uh, that was the only chip I've ever taken. Why would I want to go back out? Some go out, and I'm not saying that. But what I found in here was a peer group of people that loved me in spite of me. A peer group of people that didn't judge me because of things that happened in my life. But a group of people that would stand shoulder to shoulder me in anything. And I believe one day when I die, that when I get before my God and my maker, I'm going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with you guys. And the only thing I can do, I'm going to look up and say, these are my friends. And maybe that's all I ever need to say. You're my friends, and you are. It's been a great journey. Meeting people like you in this room, doing things like this, and just being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the first talk I ever made in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wrote it down. I was a year sober, they wouldn't let you talk, you had to hear. And I wrote it down, and I carried it in a meeting with me, and I made a disaster. I read everything on that page, you know. It, it one of you an AA talk, I promise you that. And uh, I got reminded of it. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't write things down. I don't practice talks and stuff like that. But I'd like to close with something, if you'll allow me to do, that I'm going to read. And it's from our AA literature. It's a member of the view of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's one of the greatest pamphlets that's ever come out of the USO. If you haven't got one, get one and read it from front to back. Try to read it when read it. When Hulk came in that night, he had a big book on his arm, had a leather cover on it. It had big book Hulk J. And in that book, he had some pamphlets. And one of them is this, this uh, pamphlet of members I view of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he told me after you read the first 164 pages when you can, and you read it out of my book, I want my book back, and we'll get you one. And we did, and, and uh, Hulk's dead now, but I've got that book that he 12 stepped me with, that second edition with left cover on it. And then he told me there's a pamphlet in there that I want you to get out and read. And you read it from the front to the back after you've read the big book. And I'd like to close with this. And, and it's something that touches me very strongly. And the writer says, tonight if I could find one fault with AA, it would be that we have not yet begun to tap the potential hidden in the last seven words of the 12th step. Practice these principles in all our affairs. And he goes on to write, it occurred to me not long ago that whenever I'm sitting in an AA meeting, I'm never aware that I'm sitting next to another white man, another Catholic, another American, or Frenchman, Mexican, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, black man, or brown. I'm aware only that I'm sitting next to another alcoholic. And it seemed deeply significant to me 
that this feeling of common humanity had been purchased by me at the cost of considerable pain and suffering. And he goes on to read the next paragraph, should this hard one understanding of and feeling for others be confined to the meeting halls and members of Alcoholics Anonymous? Or does it remain for me to take what I've learned and what I have experienced not only in AA, but in every other area and endeavor of my life. To lift up my head and to assume my rightful place in the family of man. Can I there in this household of God know that I'm not, ne I'm not sitting next to another white man, another Catholic, another American, nor yet a Frenchman, Mexican, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, black man or brown, not even another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can finally say at long last, please God, come home from all the wars and say in the very depth of my soul, I am sitting next to another human being. Thank you for my life. It's my family. God bless you.